Yes. Lord Patton, before lunch, we were looking at um, the documentation relating to the production of a Health Education Council leaflet um, and how that interrelated with the production of the blood donors leaflet. Um, I want to pick that up um, uh, in April 1984 with a document at DHSC 000-2309 underscore 041, please. Um, now we can see this is a minute of the 25th of April 1984. It's sent by Lord Glenarthur's private office um, and it's copied to uh, your private office, to Miss McKessack. Um, it, in relation to the uh, first three paragraphs, it deals there with whether there should be um, a, a Health Education Council leaflet. It, it refers to a difference of view between you and Lord Glenarthur. I'm, I'm not proposing to ask you about, about that new pattern. What I just want to refer to is the fourth paragraph, which says he, that's Lord Glenarthur, would like a fuller note on the successful National Blood Transfusion Service leaflet trial referred to at paragraph four of Mr Cunningham's submission which was the submission we looked at before lunch. So um, the purpose of showing you this is just to give us the date, Lord Patton, 25th of April 84, Lord Glenarthur asked for a fuller note on, on what had happened with the trial in relation to the blood donor leaflet. Um, if, if we just then go to DHSC 0002321 underscore 045... We can see the next day, 26th of April 1984, Dr. Smithers, who had taken over the role that Dr. Wolford um, uh, previously uh, fulfilled in Med SEB, uh, says to, to Mr. Cunningham in the first paragraph, I'm uncertain of the current state of play about plans for the submission to ministers on this leaflet and have noticed Lord Glenarthur's comments on the reference to it in the briefing sent to him covering the MRC press conference. She then provides some, some notes about the um, dra a draft submission. And then the last of that is says, in paragraph five, I suggest you omit last year from the sentence about blood donors as we are amending the leaflet to bring it up to date. Now, so that's the last paragraph of the minute, Lord Patton. Again, I've shown you this not because I have a particular question, but just to show the stages. Yes. We're still in April. And what we learned from this is that... Um, the department's still in the process of amending the leaflet. That, yeah. So that's, that's the end of April. Um, the submission to ministers um, about um, revising the, the blood donor leaflet um, is then at DHSC 0002309 underscore 044. So you'll see it's a minute dated the 10th of August 1984. It's copied to your private office, to Ms. Uh, to Ms. McKessack, um, uh, and it's headed revision of leaflet, AIDS and how it concerns blood donors. Uh, I attach a submission from Mr. Williams, which seeks minister's agreement to the revision of the current AIDS leaflet. Um, and then there's reference to issues relating to um, uh, uh, financing the printing of, of further leaflets. The last sentence of paragraph two says, officials believe, however, that it's vital that the AIDS leaflet should be reproduced and that it should be accorded this priority. And then if we go over the page, we will see um, the submission um, uh, on the revision of the AIDS leaflet. Now, before we look at a couple of paragraphs in that submission law pattern, we're now in August 1984. So that's almost a year since the original leaflet was published. Would you agree that on any view that was an unacceptably long period of time? It was certainly a substantial period, yes. Exactly what judgmental word one uses, I don't know, but it was, it was longer than it should have been. And do you have any understanding based on the material that you've read for the purposes of your statement as to why it took that long? No. I'm afraid I don't. Um, and then um, if we just look at the text of the submission, paragraph three, 
under the heading Factual Content of Leaflet, reports that the current AIDS leaflet is now out of date in certain detailed factual matters, and there is a need to strengthen <coughs> its warning to high-risk groups not to donate. Um, paragraph 4 reports the results of the review um, uh, and says uh, the results from the monitoring exercise indicate that distribution of these leaflets has not caused any fall in the number of blood donors and that there's been little, if any, adverse comment by donors. However, there was, as anticipated, a wide variation in the manner in which the leaflet has been distributed by the regional transfusion centres, and, and then further detail is given about that. Um, if we go further down the page, there's a paragraph headed continued need for a leaflet. That refers to the disease now being prevalent in the United Kingdom. And then bottom of the page, recommended distribution. Officials consider that the department would be open to criticism if, top of the next page, it failed to take all reasonable practicable steps to discourage all high-risk donors from giving blood. It is suggested that all those RTCs who did not send out the leaflet individually to their registered donors should now be asked to do so at the next recall of those donors. Uh, so you'll see from that law pattern, there is now a recommended distribution method, and it's the original method one from that, that submission from the previous year. Um, the reference bottom of the previous page to top of this page to the department being open to criticism if it failed to take all reasonable practicable steps to discourage all high-risk donors from giving their blood. It might be said that the department by this time had already failed to take all reasonable step, practicable steps because of the delay in looking again at the issue of the leaflet. Well, it was alarming on reading that material to see the clear statement by officials that, that this leaflet was now out of date because that could, I do not know whether it ever did, have a devastating effect if someone had rung, uh, read the outdated information and taken action or failed to take action um, which had infected them or affected them in some way or another, which is surprising. So is it fair to say looking at all this material now, does it, does it concern you that it took as long as it appears to have done for yes. this leaflet to be yes. revised. Um, now, that's August 1984. Um, we can see, that if we go to DHSC 0002309 underscore 046, Um, we can see that Lord Glen Arthur, in the course of the, the same month, August, um, uh, 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 confirms essentially his, uh, his support for the recommendations. Um, we don't, I think, have any re response uh, from you, but your private office have been I think, copied into the submission rather than being um, the direct recipient of the submission. As I read that submission as a, as a for information rather than please tell me what to do. Um, in, in terms of Mr. Clark, um, if we go to DHSC 0002309 underscore 050, um, this is Mr. Clark's response to the submission, um, and we're now in the middle of October 1984. And we see the private uh, office saying, I'm sorry, this has taken so long to clear. Yes. Now, m m Mr. Clark, Lord, Lord Clark is answerable for his own actions. I'm not suggesting that that's your responsibility, Lord Patton. But um, do, do you have any concerns about or observations to make on the length of time it's taking, having, having taken a, almost a year to get to ministers, August 1984, there's now a further two months before the Minister of State for Health no, I'm not fully informed as to what was or what wasn't going on in that period because I don't believe I was involved in any of the in any of the decisions. But it's certainly a. It's not just time taken. This is delay, which is a judgmental word, and I certainly sense we were in ju delay territory by now. We, we can then pick things up in November of 1984. PRSE 
Um, so if you look at the top of the page, first of all, please, Lord Patton, it says AIDS and blood products, John Patton, Parliamentary Secretary for Health. And then there are a number of points set out. Um, sure. For present purposes, uh, I'm concerned only with the last two paragraphs where it says there's been anxiety about interim arrangements to avoid high risk <coughs> donors. And last year, the DHSS made available through the NBTS a leaflet AIDS in the blood donor. Ministers have agreed that the message in the leaflet should be strengthened and a revised version is to be issued individually to every donor. And then if we just go to the bottom of the page, it says there... And I, had, I do beg your pardon, I had prefaced that in the penultimate paragraph that either I said or I was drafted to say there has been anxiety about interim arrangements, yeah. which um, I shared. And then we can see at the bottom, it says, relayed to BBC TV News, Radio, ITN, IRN, PA, between 6 and 7 p.m., 18th of November. So... Um, there's a formal press release of, of the, on the following day, the 19th of November, that we, we, we've got the, the, the terms of which. But do, do you know what this document represents? Is this... Would you have been giving interviews, do you know? Or um, it, it, do, well, do you know why this is attributed to you at the top of the in page? In the page I'm looking at, going back to earlier discussions, it's quite clear that the in people in the information department and press department decided not to put out anything until they told correspondence in order to presumably, if the correspondence chose to read my stuff, um, that uh, uh, this was happening and this was important. So this was part of the way in which the, the media contacts were handled. But I, I've got no knowledge at all of why, for example, um, I was asked to do that, but I was asked for it for some reason or another, someone was away or it was back to the old stuff which I have mentioned in my submission before, that there was a general tendency to expect um, ministers in the DHSS who were ministers in the House of Commons to handle most things, because that was thought to be more meaningful. Um, and then if we just look at the formal press release, which was PRSE <coughs> 0002251... This is the 19th of November, 1984. Um, Britain to be self-sufficient in blood products by late 1986. More health education and research on AIDS is the heading. And then we can see this is essentially attributed to you, John Patton. Sure. Uh, today said Britain should be self-sufficient in blood products. Um, and then if we just go to the bottom of the page, there's then um, a heading... Uh, blood donor leaflet, blood donors leaflets. It refers to the leaflet having been available since August 1983. It refers to it being reprinted with a strengthened message for issue within the next few weeks, and the leaflet will be given to each new donor. If we just go over the page, uh, it says that new donors, such as those attending industrial sessions, will be handed a leaflet at every such session. A circular is to be issued to MBTS detailing the distribution arrangements they must conform to. Um, so if we just go back to the first page. So for, for this press release to be going out in your name, um, what, what involvement would you have had in that process? Well, I would, of course, had it put up to me um, with covering advice from whomsoever. I, I don't know that that's, that survived. Though it would have come up with a submission uh, which might have said that it was appropriate for me to handle it for the following reasons or whatever. But um, that, I think, is all, all I can add by way of elucidation or clarification. Um, maybe um, it was felt that it was much more important to have a House of Commons person talking about that, or it could be that uh, PSL was away. I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Um now, although at the bottom of the page, this, this release of the 19th of November 84 talked about the leaflet being reprinted and the strengthened message and, and, and so on, 
what, what we know, um, and, and, and you've referred to it in your statement, is that actually there were then various other communications with the information division getting involved and suggestions about redrafting and the matter going to Mr. Clark and Mr. Clark having to be chased at the end of December and so on. Um, um, I, I'm not, I think, going to um, go, go through the detail of it because, again, to, to the extent that you were involved, it's largely as a copy recipient, I think, rather than um, 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 much by way of direct involvement. Um, but what we see is that ultimately it's the 1st of February 1985 yes. when the new leaflet is produced. Um, again, looking at it now, does that further period of time delay from November to end of January, beginning of February trouble you? It's ununderstandable as to why it happened. I mean, I don't know what was going on or what was not going on, as I don't seem to have been at any meetings on this. But it's not easily understandable, because generally speaking, if there are urgent matters in any department you're um, in, there's a sense of urgency that we better get this stuff out. Why, where, what, where that sense of urgency had gone to, I don't know. And for what reasons, I don't know. And I cannot speculate, alas. Um, th there's just one final topic on this document, uh, sorry, one final document on this topic then to, to ask you about DHSC 0002309 underscore 062. This is a minute of the 20th of December 1984 from Mr. Clark's private office to Dr. Abrams in Med SCB. And you will see, um, you'll see it was copied to your private office, copied to Ms. McKessack. In the, sec sorry, in the third paragraph, you'll see that um, um, Mr. Clark um, has, was essentially looking there at, at the text of the proposed leaflet, um, and he asks for there to be cooperation between Med SCB and the Information Division in producing a third and hopefully final version of the leaflet. Um, I, I don't know whether you would have read this, Mr. Patton, uh, Lord, Pat Lord Patton at the time, um, but if you had, and so this is a hypothetical question, would it have occurred to you to possibly try and um, intervene with Mr. Clark and try and chase up the process? Or, or, or was that not something that he would have been amenable to? That was not something that I would um, immediately feel um, that it was my job to do, because by this stage, lots of wheels were clearly grinding. Business was being done, into which I was not copied. Um, MSH, Mr. Clark saying, uh, second sentence, uh, para three, I should be grateful, therefore, if you and your medical policy division colleagues would cooperate with information division. It's obvious what was going on was that the policy world and the medical policy division and the information division were all taking an active role in suggesting drafts and redrafts. Uh, many cooks involved in this particular um, dish that eventually came out. And I suppose if I knew about it at all at the time or had uh, read this properly, this looked to me like work in progress that was grinding slowly, uh, maybe for good reasons, but it turned out that there were no particular reasons that I could see, except <coughs> different bits of the department not necessarily working in closely together as maybe in retrospect they should have been. Okay, thank you. But I, I don't point the finger at any official or any officials. I, I've no idea what was actually going on. Um, we can take that down, thank you, Lawrence. Um, Lord Patton, I'm going to move now to a, a further topic, and that's the question of the introduction of screening or testing yeah, yeah. blood donations um, for, for HIV. This is section five, is it? Section right? five of your yeah. statement, yes. Um, I, I'm going to just start with a document that you wouldn't have seen at the time, but just to, 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 to ask you some general questions about it. DHSC 
Um, this is a minute dated the 10th of July 1984 um, from uh, Dr. Abrams to Dr. Smithers. Um, and it, um, if we just zoom in on the test, thank you. Um, uh, so uh, it, it refers to some plans outlined by Dr. Gunson. I'm afraid I don't off the top of my head know what that refers to. Um, and then uh, Dr. Abrams says, I regard it as of paramount importance to ensure that public faith in the BTS, blood transfusion service, is maintained. And surely with all the concern over age, this can only be done in the present state of knowledge by introducing a screening test as quickly as possible. We simply must ensure that our blood is okay by the most up-to-date means. I therefore propose a very strong line. A, we press those concerned to get on with research and development as quickly as possible. If successful marketing via CAMR slash industry to be lined up as soon as may be. B, we should give whatever help is needed to move this along. If money is wanted, we go to ministers for it. C, we need to consider this, the financial and other implications for the BTS of mounting a screening service. Again, we may need to go to ministers for special treatment. In short, we must give this top priority. Now, of course, that document wasn't copied to you, but would you agree or would you have agreed at the time with the sentiments being expressed there about the need to introduce a screening test as quickly as possible to take a very strong line and give it top priority? Yes, and there's a, a footnote to that. In my experience, it's fairly unusual, even in uh, submissions between senior officials, for anyone much to use the, the phrase, in short, we must give this top priority, as Dr. Abrahams, Abrams does. And I mean, I think that was a very welcome steer he was giving, uh, speaking out like that and cutting across some of the problems we were just discussing in the last, in the last section. So I think he got it right. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to pick um, the picture up in relation to uh, screening um, next in November 1984 in, in terms of the contemporaneous documents. This is DHSC 00023090 underscore 057. <coughs> Um, this is a minute of the 30th of November 1984 from uh, Mr. Williams. Again, it's copied to your private office, to Ms. Ms. McKessack. Um, not, it's directed, I think, to Lord Glen Arthur's um, uh, private office. Um, if we look at the top of the page, um, we can see it says, Ministers will wish to be aware of three incidents of UK blood being given by donors found positive by the screening test for HTLV3 antibody. Um, in one case, the infection had been transmitted to a number of recipients, none of whom has yet developed AIDS, but this is a possibility. There's then background, um, it refers there to the details, um, if we look at paragraph 2A and B, um, to donors who had given donations um, being found to be uh, HGLV3 positive. Um, and then at paragraph 3, it says this, knowledge of these incidents, particularly A, is becoming more widespread and is likely to reach the media before too long. Haemophilia centre directors managing the haemophiliacs involved may well feel that they have to inform their patients of the situation. Um, uh, Lord Patton, do, do you have any thoughts or reflections on, on that paragraph there, the reference to haemophilia centre directors may well feel they have to inform their patients of the situation? Shouldn't that have been a given that patients being placed at risk or, or potentially given in, in contaminated products should be informed? Well, in principle, yes, uh, of course. I, I don't know if uh, language of a, a very formal and rather old-fashioned um, form was often used within government circles, particularly between civil servants, and some people may well have thought, to use the, the phrase a second time, that saying may well feel is, a, is a, point, a pointed remark, saying get on with it. But I simply don't understand wh what language was being used. But sometimes there was oratond, oratund, rather old-fashioned language used, which uh, I suspect to many people was a signal just, just get on with it. Whether that was uh, the message was received, I don't know. So I can't speculate further. Understood. Um, there's then the heading defensive press briefing 
And then it said these incidents reinforce the current policy of the department, and then three matters are set out. The, the revision of the leaflet, which we've already looked at, the developing of a screening test and carrying out pilot studies of the test in North London Transfusion Centre, uh, and three is considering the use of, of heat treatment of factor eight. Um, just the heading there, defensive press briefing. Not a nice phrase, I think. No, I mean, was, was that your impression of the... Um, the way in which the department operated in 83 to 85, that it, 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 it took a defensive line, it wished to present its actions in the best possible light and avoid criticism? I mean, there's an a enormous amount of difference in briefings that I received in five departments over 13 years between the, the phrase, which is not often used, but is used here, uh, a defensive press um, briefing, and the other more sensible and more descriptive thing would be for use if pressed. That was the, the, the thing you often found at the bottom of submissions, which means watch it. You're going to get some difficult questions. And that means you're going to be pressed. And you know, if this does happen, let's hope it doesn't. These are the things, and these are civil servants trying to be helpful in what they were doing. But defensive is, is not, a, as I said earlier before, who even questioned me, it's not, not a phrase I like at all, and it makes me uneasy seeing it. Because the department should have been on the front foot, not defensive. But there may well be difficult questions to answer, and therefore it would be right for several servants to draft for ministers lines to use if pressed, because ministers don't know everything here. Um, if we then move next to January 1985, DHSC... 000562. <clears throat> and Lord what I'm going to do is show you a handful of documents relating to the introduction of screening, not all of the documents you've, re you've helpfully referred to in, in, in your witness statement, and then ask you some general questions about the, the decision making process. But we can just pick up here Dr. Smithers, um, uh, 11th of January 85, provides to Dr. Alderslade. Um, what I think was a draft submission, and we don't, I think, in, in relation to this one, have the, the final submission. Um, uh, but a draft submission which uh, says, CMO wish to consider this submission prepared with administrative colleagues for ministers to obtain approval in principle for the introduction of a screening test for AIDS antibodies. The UK test is currently being used at the Middlesex Laboratory and at the Central Public Health Laboratory, Collindale, to detect antibody carriers amongst patients thought to have AIDS or the AIDS-related complex, haemophiliacs and male homosexuals attending STD clinics. <coughs> Scale-up of production of the reagent is necessary before the test can be applied more widely. And then if we go over the page, we see the text of the submission. Um, I, I don't uh, want to go through the entirety of it, but we can see in the first paragraph, second sentence, says that the submission seeks ministers' agreement in principle to the introduction of a test to screen all blood donations for evidence of infection with the AIDS virus. Um, a number of matters are then um, set out. Um, I think for present purposes, if we just go over to page four, we can see the second paragraph, again, uses the phrase in principle. Ministers are asked to agree in principle to the introduction of a screening test for AIDS antibody for all blood donations and to an announcement to be made to this effect at the mm. appropriate moment, indicating that the development of a test is being backed by the department. Now, what you said in your witness statement in relation to this law pattern is that you may have seen this, you don't know, but if you had, you think you would have agreed with it, yes. you'd have seen no reason to withhold agreement in principle. No, and rereading this as enlarged, that's right. Um, so that, that, there we are in January 1985. I then just want to pick up the picture um, by reference to a document from April 1985, DHSC 00022670034. This is the 16th of April 1985, and these are um, oral questions and answers uh, uh, in Parliament. We see the heading on the left-hand side of the play page, Blood Donors AIDS. Yep. Um, and then um, I think we can look 
uh, you, de de deals there with the issue of the, the leaflet. I don't think we need to go back to that. We can look towards the bottom of the page where we have a question from Mr. Key. Does my honourable friend agree that those of us who are blood donors have a responsibility to give a lead? Can he assure us that the HTLV3 test, which is promised for July, is still on target? Because that will give great hope to the regional blood transfusion authorities. And then your answer was, yes, we hope to have a screening test within a few weeks. Um, firstly, Lord Patton, do, do you have any knowledge of, of the basis for Mr. Key's understanding that the test had been promised for July? None whatsoever. Um, although there was a certain amount of discussion, I think, earlier in the year, maybe February or April, when the senior and distinguished official, Mr. Hart, had, I think, talked to um, regional directors in blood transfusion and had suggested that a test was coming along in a few months, I think was the phrase. So I think that there's been a, a, perhaps a bit of running together by a number of people of these bits of information, including myself. Yes, and we can pick that up at DHSC 00000555. Because you having said in, in Parliament that, that you hope to have a screening test within a few weeks, it was then drawn to the attention of your private office that the more accurate position, it was said, this is the second paragraph, would be to say we hope to begin evaluating screening tests within the next few weeks. The work is due to start on the 13th of May and full evaluation is likely to take several months. Realistically, a screening test for HDLV3 antibody is unlikely to be introduced routinely into the MBTS until the latter half of 1985. Um, and I think you've said in your statement you, you, you're not sure how it is that you you got the position wrong, and you say it may well have been your mistake, but it, it having been drawn to your attention here, I think the suggestion was you would then write to Mr Key to correct the parliamentary record. Well, I'm extremely grateful to uh, Mr Williams, who was uh, clearly an astute uh, civil servant who spotted my mistake, or what seems to have been my mistake, um, as it undoubtedly was, and it's very good that he saw it and drew it to my attention because that gave me the opportunity to write to Mr. Key and say, um, I, I um, in polite language, I must clarify what I said, actually meaning I, I made a mistake. Um, no pleas in mitigation are, are, are um, needed in um, public inquiries, but all I would say that in the um, 13 years in five different departments that I was answering questions, I must have answered four-figure number of written questions, not oral questions, and certainly many hundreds of oral questions. I mean, I can't remember um, any other occasion where I was pulled up short, but I'm glad I was pulled up short because it's my clear belief that all ministers must always seek to give to Parliament that information which is um, truthful and effective. Well, I, I do reflect also that, the, that it was never followed up by Robert Key or anyone else. There was no... Um, uh, to do about it, but it shouldn't have happened. And for whatever reasons it happened, it happened. Um, now, the, the, the um, perhaps more fundamental question I have arising out of, of this is, this is now April 1985. We looked at the, a, a few minutes ago at that a minute from 1984 where it had been said we must take a strong line, this is top priority, it should be done as soon as possible. We had the agreement in principle in January 1985. Here, it's being pointed out to you that actually the work in evaluating the screening tests has not yet even begun and is going to begin in approximately mm. a month's time. Do you have either any recollection or, or any sense now looking, looking back at the document um, about whether there was a, a lack of of a sufficient sense of, of urgency about the introduction of the tests? I cannot remember any, anything, but, but on the face of it, it's, a, it's a, a perfectly proper suggestion to make that urgency um, was needed in, uh, and on, another, uh, on a number of other occasions which you've questioned me on this morning, that that sense of urgency and maybe a greater sense of defensiveness on 
some occasions. Um, just for the transcript, I don't propose to, to go to it, but um, you'd mentioned, I think, a communication from Mr Hart to regional health authorities, um, and, and that had been earlier in the year, February 85. For the transcript, it's DHSC 00002261 underscore 031. Um, what I wanted to do is then pick up a, 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 a document which suggests there have been some discussions between you and the Chief Medical Officer. Yeah. So that's DHSC 0002482 underscore 031. This is Mr. Harris to Dr. Smithers on the 5th of June 1985. Um, and it says, you'll know there is, to be a, there is a meeting with Dr. Harris Thursday, Mr. France will attend, and possibly a meeting with PSH, so that would have been you, Friday, but see below. I met Mr. France on Tuesday. He's going to talk to CMO, suggesting that I put a submission for ministers to him, CMO, by the end of the week. He's also going to suggest to CMO and also PSH that the meeting is postponed until this submission has been considered. I attach my first draft. I'm revising the structure of this to reflect the starting point which CMO slash PSH now want, i.e. the speedy introduction of a screening test into BTS on available data without waiting for confirmatory tests, etc. Um, I do not suggest you comment in detail on this version. My revision will, at Mr. Francis's suggestion, include the decision tree. Um, now, that second paragraph suggests, first of all, that, that you and Sir Donald had been having discussions about the issue of the introduction of the screening test. Um, and secondly, that you and Sir Donald were... Um, considering or, or, or advocating um, introducing a screening test on, on the information currently available without waiting for confirmatory testing to become available. Beyond what's set out in this document, do you have anything further, either by way of recollection or by way of what you think you might have raised with Sir Donald, that, that would help us understand more the nature of the discussions you had with him? Well, I think I had a number of what you might call side discussions in corridors over a cup of coffee or whatever, because I was very interested in AIDS um, from the health education always point of view. And I'd taken his advice on a number of occasions. I see he was going to suggest that I was uh, go to a meeting on a Friday. That would have been most unusual for me because I'd normally be in my constituency um, on a Friday meeting and listening to my constituents problems. He, maybe he wanted it on a Friday because there was some time timetabling issue. But um, I am perfectly content that all the proper lines of communication between myself and CMO where anything was suggested of a policy change, not of a decision change, uh, was always put forward, particularly as the, the evolving story of um, of uh, this uh, series of tests and uh, what the final decision was to be. Um, but you can't recall any more um, um, about the content of that discussion other than what we see set No, I wish there. I could. Um, yes, but uh, I can't. And then if we, um, if we move forward a couple of days to the 7th of June 1985, we get the submission or paper um, being provided to uh, the CMO and to you DHSC 0002311 underscore 019. <coughs> um, so we'll see 7th of June. It's from Mr. Harris. Top of the page, it's, it's said, addressed to Dr. Hunt, if CMO is content, and then two to Ms. McKessack, so your private office. Um, it, we're told that the attached paper sets out the proposed strategy for introducing a screening test for blood donations as previously agreed. And I'll, rather than go through paragraph two, we'll look at that in the body of the submission in a moment. But if we could just go down to paragraph three of this minute. It says this, if ministers agree this approach, there could be merit in making details public, perhaps in a written answer and press statement, this could take presentational advantage of the extra funding for PHLS, as well as stressing the importance attached to safeguarding the BTS as soon as possible, whilst not impairing its operational efficiency. Having such a statement on record could be helpful if a well-publicized case of AIDS attributable to infected blood occurs. I just wanted to try and unpick that paragraph with you, Lord Patton, because, again, it, it, it could be said 
that's looking at the reputation of the department and the obtaining of presentational advantages. Yeah. Do you have any observations about that? Well, I am unhappy with, I said earlier, the defensive um, briefing, and I'm equally a bit unhappy with that, with that particular language, presentational advantage. I, do, I don't think that's what the DHSS was in the business of, was presenting things well. It should be presenting things truthfully, which I think on most occasions we did. And, you know, I've been corrected on, on a number of occasions by officials like uh, Mr. Williams over that parliamentary answer, but, you know, within the department, no, 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 no. Um, Under Secretary, you know, that's not the right phrase to use, you must use that use. I, I, I never found um, uh, officials backward in coming forward if they, were, if they were unhappy, but I don't think presentational advantage is a, is a good... I can't quite read the whole copy list. Was I copied on this? Um, yes, top of the page. Oh, it came to me. It came... It looks like it was okay. going to the CMO and to, to your private office. So we're certain that it... I don't recognise the handwriting, but yes is my answer to your question. And then if we go over the page, we can see the text of the submission. Um, uh, under the heading backgrounds, if I can just draw your attention or pattern first of all to paragraph two, screening's not yet started in the UK. It is in use nationally in Australia, widespread in the USA and the Netherlands. France and Germany will introduce it nationally later this summer. Cases of AIDS contracted through the use of UK donated blood have not yet occurred, but can be expected. When these are announced, the publicity may well draw comparisons between action abroad and apparent inactivity here. Um, again, I appreciate you, 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 you don't have a memory now of, of, of how you would have responded to, or how you did respond to this submission, but you see there the reference to screening being available in other countries, yes, um, but not yet in the United Kingdom. Do, do you think that would have caused you concern that the, the UK was not introducing yet something which other developed nations um, either had or were about to introduce? I simply can't remember. I, I've got absolutely no memory whatsoever. Um, if we go just to the Next paragraph. Well, be before we do that, uh, I'm a little puzzled about the, the third sentence of paragraph two. Cases of AIDS contracted through the use of UK donated blood have not yet occurred but can be expected. Given what I think you showed me earlier, um, or showed uh, Lord Patton earlier, uh, on the 30th of November 1984, that's, it's DHSC. Three zeros, two three zero nine underscore zero five seven, uh, and that I, I think mentioned three incidents where UK blood had been obtained from positive donors, uh, one of whom had gone on to infect uh, three people. So I think the distinction may be between those who are HTLV3 positive... And those who've got AIDS. And those who've got AIDS. So... So the, what's being said here is that it's known that there are three recipients who are now seropositive, i.e. HTLV3 positive, as well as the 38 haemophiliacs who, who've been given factor H who are being followed up. Um, and then if we go to the submission that we were looking at... So, Lawrence, if we go back to DHSC 0002311 underscore 019, page two. Um, so, it's, it says cases of AIDS contracted through the use yes. of... Yes. So, it's, it may be strictly accurate, but it could be said not telling the full story. Yes, it, it's, it, it's perhaps um, a shade... Uh, of a pity that it's in a paragraph which talks about screening for HIV and then goes on not to say cases of HIV contracted have already occurred but cases of AIDS. But that I think but is... But I do see the distinction. Um, so Lord, Lord Patton, if we just look at paragraph three then on this page, it says implementation of a screening policy requires A, selection of suitable tests, B, 
B, parallel provision of testing facilities outside the blood transfusion service. C, provision of facilities to carry out confirmatory tests. And D, provision of advice to donors found to be positive. And then um, we can see the options are set out at paragraph four. The options are one, select an available test on current knowledge as soon as possible. Two, test, select after evaluation of tests by the Public Health Laboratory Service. Three, select after both evaluation and blood transfusion service field trials. Um, so that, those are the three options. Introduce a test as soon as possible, have a one-stage evaluation by, by the PHLS, or have a two-stage evaluation by both the PHLS and the yes. blood transfusion service. If we go to the next page, and, and I, I should note, I'm not going to read it out, but paragraph six talks about the issue of, of, of false positives. And then we see the discussion of options. And I don't, again, propose to go through it line by line, but we see uh, officials set out their views on the merits of each option. So option one yep. is not recommended. So that's the introducing it on, on the basis of current knowledge. Option two, introduce it on the basis of the PHLS evaluations, not recommended. And then over the page... The recommended option is wait for the, both the evaluation by the and Public the Health Laboratory Service yeah. and the Blood Transfusion Service field trials, which might take five months to implement. Um, now, it's absolutely right, I should point out that there's a number of other points here set out. There's issues about supply, issues about confirmatory testing. If we just go down the, down the page, Lawrence, so that we can just see briefly. So we've got confirmatory testing there. Um, uh, um, and then a point on the next page about alternative source of testing. And I'll, 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 I'll come on to that, in the, 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 that point under alternative source of testing in a moment. But um, looking at those, those three options, the recommended option was to await for the two-stage evaluation and only then introduce testing. A again, bearing in mind what had been said the previous year about as soon as possible, strong line, top priority. Looking at it now, do you have any concerns about whether the option that was being put forward for, for approval by, by yourself and the CMO was, was the right option, or, or, or in, 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 given that it would bring with it further delay? I, th I think it seemed to me at the time to be, to be the, uh, the right option with all the sorts of provisos about double negatives and double positive tests and, and all those other problems which were above my intellectual pay grade because I'm, I'm not a scientist. But I was very keen, I believe at the time, that the test should be as effective as possible in the interests of those people who, who'd, who'd, who'd been uh, infected most, most of all, but also to reassure their, their relatives and loved ones and also to reassure the general public. It's a very difficult balance to strike for officials. Uh, and then if we just look at the point in paragraph 11, I'll, I'll may come on to this in a few minutes, but just so that you, we see what, what's being talked about here. Alternative source of testing, what I understand that to mean is making available facilities for people to be tested, for example, at STD clinics, because there appears to have been a fear that people might turn up to blood transfusion, blood donation sessions. Yeah for the purposes of finding out if they were HTLV3 positive or not. Yes. And so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, but that's yeah. the issue being... Very important point, if I may say. Um, and then if we just go over the page, to page six, we, we've got the strategy <coughs> that was set out there. Um, so point one was um, the test should be selected after evaluation by the PHLS and field trials. This would mean implementation of screening in October or November. Two, evaluation and field trials should continue to be conducted on new tests which emerge. Three, confirmatory testing facilities should be provided by the PHLSB. Four, alternative testing arrangements should be organised, so that's the STD clinics and the like. Um, and then five, organisation of facilities for advising positive donors and others should be the subject of a separate submission. And the advice sought was whether ministers were content with the strategy outlined above. And, and then there was an issue about funding for the Public Health Laboratory Service. Um, the next page contains 
what, what's referred to as a decision tree. I'm not going to go through it, but I just draw attention to it. Yeah, it was actually helpful to see that. Um, now, in terms of the response to that submission, it looks as though Sir Donald Aitchison wrote to you um, on the 10th of June, DHSC 0002311 underscore 021. So we can see <coughs> it's addressed to you um, and it's from um, uh, uh, the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, it says, there is a finely balanced decision here, but I am in favour of the suggested line. I think, however, that we must do everything possible to ensure that PHLS is able to keep to its schedule. As far as the option to introduce a partially evaluated ELISA test forthwith is concerned, I think the prospect of wasting a relatively small quantity of blood from false positive tests is not the major objection. The major problem is that the scientists concerned at PHLS do not yet have confidence that the suppliers could produce testing kits which are reliable on a large scale and which would continue to be reliable on the shelf. It would be worse to be in the position of having to withdraw a test once introduced than to be in our present position of carefully evaluating the tests. There could also be ethical problems in refusing to tell donors who are volunteers in this country the result of a test carried out on their blood if they wish to have it. Ministers should recognise, however, that support for a different view is likely to appear in the medical press, see Professor Bloom's letter attached, and that considerable public pressure would develop if in the meantime a case of AIDS develops in a recipient of UK blood. Such a case or cases is likely to occur sooner or later due to infection one or more years ago prior to our warnings to people at risk not to donate blood. Um, now, your statement tells us that you're not aware of any, any response from you or indeed other ministers to the submission. But they can't apparently be traced. No, There's that's correct. Nothing in the archives anywhere. Not, not that's not been found, I think, either by the inquiry or by the, the government legal department. Which is rather surprising because it's quite a critical issue, this. Yes. So we have Sir Donald writing to you. Yeah. Um, uh, um, and we'll see later in June there is an announcement then made by Mr Clark um, to the effect that this is the, 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 the programme to be adopted. Um, again, I appreciate you, you don't have any recollection or any document to prompt you, but do you have any sense of what your reaction or, or, or response might have been to receiving a, a letter of this kind or a note of this kind from, from Sir Donald? He's saying finely balanced, but ultimately in favour of the suggested line. Would it have been your approach to sort of work, fall in line behind Sir Donald on the basis he's the expert, or, 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 or would you have wanted to reach your own assessment of the, of the options? Well, I, I certainly make no apology. I always deferred to him because he knew about the science and, and I didn't. He did say that it was a very finely... Uh, balanced uh, decision for him to take and I believe having read and reread and, and thought about it uh, since the inquiry kindly supplied me with uh, with all the details I think one of the things that would have um, made me even more um, determined to see this particular option pursued is because of the effects of if we had gone down a faster route and something had gone wrong with the tests, the effects on the people affected by AIDS and their families, and the effects on public belief in the ability of the DHSS to handle this issue could have been devastating. Uh, and, uh, and that was my policy sense coming through. The, the converse of that, playing devil's advocate, as it were, Lord, Lord, Lord Patton, of course, is that if, if you defer the introduction of testing essentially on the basis of wanting to have absolutely everything set up correctly and um, before you, you do so, you run the risk that in the intervening period, people may be infected with AIDS who would otherwise, with HTLV3, who, other, who otherwise would not have been infected. Well, that's, I guess, and I can't be certain, I can't put words into Sir Donald Aitchison's mind or, or, or late mind, that he would have had that very clearly in front of his views. This is a, a balanced decision, and it's a very reasonable point, if I may say, with respect you make. But I, I, 
a hold to my earlier response. Uh, again, it, it might be said perfection can be the enemy of the good, that, that um, sometimes it may be better to, to, to go with what you have. There was a test that had been licensed by this time by the FDA in the States, and not, not necessarily without problems, but nonetheless, there was something available, something in use in other countries, um, uh, which, which could have been potentially introduced into the blood transfusion service earlier than it was. In the end, um, and I don't speak in my own mitigation, those are decisions which could, aside from policy implications, only be taken by medically qualified people as to, you know, like like a scientist peer reviewing another scientist, what's the likelihood of this going wrong, this going right? And that's why I personally was taken um, by Sir Donald's very honest and open, you know, not, not unequivocal, he's saying lots of problems here, and the sorts of problems you rightly have adduced would undoubtedly have been part of that, I believe. Um, now, um, th there are various documents you've referred to in your statement, tail end of June, envisaging that the, the announcement by Mr. Clark of the, um, uh, 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 the, the proposed way forward. I, I'm not going to take time going through e all of those. None of them, I think, originate from you. Um, ju just wanted to ask you about one further document um, from the CMO, DHSC 0002482 underscore 042. Um, we can see, again, this is June 85, it's copied to Ms. McKezak, so it comes to your private office. Um, it's from Dr. Hunt, who is in, I think, the CMO's private office. Uh, CMO has seen Mr. Harris's minute to you dated the 21st of June with the attached draft press release and has commented, we need a properly set out case for the scientific reasons for this policy as it will be controversial, the press release is secondary to the above. Uh, the, 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 the press release he's referring to is about the, the, this issue of the introduction of the screening tests. Um, it, it's just a reference to the, the policy will be controversial. D do you recall um, any um, discussions or have any sense of what, what Sir Donald might have had in mind when he refers to the policy being controversial? No. It except there must have been debate about the scientific reasons by Sir Donald and his um, line colleagues about the policy, and that they, they would have been reviewing um, those scientific reasons. And that is why, in the end, he had to make a policy recommendation based on fully examined and fully internally debated scientific reasons, which neither me more, nor my fellow ministers were up to taking, simply not qualified to do it. Um, now I'm just going to then pick matters up at the end of July 1985, PRSE 0002078. Um, this is a letter from um, uh, Mr. Harris to regional general managers, um, re regional medical officers um, and others, 30th of July 1985, and it just explains the position. This is really just to get the, the next stage in the chronology established law pattern. Um, it says, in his press release dated the 27th of June, the Minister for Health announced that a test would be introduced to screen all blood given by blood donors for antibodies to the virus which causes AIDS. Arrangements would also be made for sexually transmitted diseases clinics to provide a test for people who fear they may have been exposed to the disease. And then if we go further down, the first stage of the evaluation of commercially available test kits has now been completed on behalf of DHSS by the Public Health Laboratory Service. The outcome of that evaluation has been considered by a panel of experts and a summary of their recommendations is attached. The National Blood Transfusion Service is now undertaking its own second stage evaluation covering aspects peculiar to the use of kits in the blood donation screening context. Um, do, do, do you have any concerns 
looking at the material now as you have, obviously, years after the event for the purposes of your witness statement, um, uh, about the continuing to insist on the second stage evaluation process. So assuming that the first stage evaluation was a, a legitimate step to take, do you have any concerns as to whether it was necessary to, to defer the introduction of screening until this second stage evaluation had taken place? Well, I think I was taken with the science as explained to ministers and to me by, by CMO. I don't think I was qualified to take that decision. And there are some decisions it's not safe to leave in ministers' hands. They need to be in the hands of experts who take the decision and then say, these are the upsides, these are the downsides. That's what we're saying. Do you want to proceed down this route? And if not, please bat it back and we'll have it reviewed again some other way. But it should not and should never be, I think, a preemptive role, particularly in a, in a science-dominated department like the Department of Health, for, for ministers to superimpose their own scientific judgments, and that's what this will be doing, um, on policy. Um, now, in uh, August 1985, there was an article in the New Scientist. Uh, yeah. criticising ministers for delaying the launch of the AIDS test. I'm not at the moment going to ask you to look at the article itself. For the transcript, the reference is DHSC 00000509. Um, what I just want to look at with you is a document at DHSC 00000501. This is from Dr. Smithers, 16th of August, 1985. It's addressed to your private office, Ms. McKezak. Um, the heading refers to the New Scientist article, and then we can see paragraph one says, PSH has asked for briefing about the article in the New Scientist on the 8th of August. So it, it seems fairly clear it had come to your attention, that, yeah. and you wanted to know what the department's response yeah, was. Yeah, I think I occasionally read that, like I occasionally read um, other things, like the New Statesman or whatever, um, with, with interest, or someone who knew me said, have you seen this? There's trouble coming here. I don't know what the answer was, but I certainly read it. And that stirred me up to ask Jane McKezek to ask for some advice on, it was this true? Um, and then, I, again, I'm not proposing to go through I each... I mean, I never, I never, do pick up on, I, I, I never um, would ever say, don't believe what you read in the newspapers, because sometimes the newspapers manifestly come out with the truth and make sure other people don't do. But you always want to get a second guess on, on, a, on, on what a journalist has written, if it's particularly about science. Um, now, I'm not going to go through each of the paragraphs. There's, there's a response from Dr. Smithers to um, ver the various points that were made in the New Scientist article, um, w w and, and those can, can, can be read in, um, in, in due course. Um, I just wanted to pick up a couple of the points. Um, so, bottom of the page, please, Lawrence. Um, so, this is in response to the point about the DHSS waiting for comprehensive and proper assessment of all screening tests. I think it's right to say that that was exactly what the DHSS was doing. Um, this is, uh, as it were, a, a, I think, justification of, of, of the position. Um, uh, and so what's said here, reports to officials and professional advisers from the USA for some months before and after FDA licensing of the tests suggested that the level of false positive results was high. Quite apart from donations needlessly being jettisoned, all reactive donations would require record clouds flagged continued surveillance of the donor and possibly difficulties over confidentiality. It was for these reasons that it was agreed an evaluation of the available tests was required. Uh, and then it says this, whilst DHSS informed health authorities that they were carrying out an evaluation of the tests, at no time has any health authority been prevented from instituting tests should they wish. However, in the BTS con content, I think that should be context, RTDs advised the HSS of the consequences of uncoordinated introduction of screening <laughs> into the blood transfusion service for the donors, the effect on recruitment of donors, the probability that introduction of screening attracts high-risk donors and thus the need for alternative testing sites. All this pointed to a coordinated national implementation. This was agreed with PSL, um, so that would be Lord Glenartha and MSH. That would be Mr. Clark. Um, 
Oh, Baroness Trumpington, you're absolutely right. By this stage, PSL is Baroness Trumpington. Um, if we go back to the previous page... Um, um, again, just look at the, that bottom paragraph. Um, the reference there to at no time any health authority having been prevented from instituting tests should they wish. Uh, um, would it be right to, to, to say that although that might be theoretically possible, what followed about the un consequences of uncoordinated introduction of screening? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What followed? Yes. What, what follows in this note yeah. immediately after that? So the last three pages, having said that no, at no time has health authorities been prevented from instituting tests if they want to, it then goes on to say that regional transfusion directors advise the department of the consequences of the uncoordinated introduction of screening. And over the page it says there should, have been a, should be a coordinated national implementation. So would it be right to understand it wasn't was never realistic to suggest that individual health authorities were free to go off and do their own thing, was it? I don't believe so, no. No. Um, and then, if we just go then to the bottom um, half of this page... Sorry, next page, my apologies, Lawrence. You'll see paragraphs 9 and 10 refer to the welcome test... Yep. First to welcome being a late entry, this is in paragraph 9, to the diagnostic kit field. Um, uh, and then um, uh, 10 says, we've been assured that welcome will be able to supply the needs of the blood transfusion um, service. Now, um, um, a, 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 a suggestion that, that um, uh, or an, infer an inference that might be drawn from some of the, the overall material the inquiry has seen is, uh, is that... Um, Officials were keen for there to be um, a UK-based test, the welcome test. Do you have any sense of whether the process was somehow slowed down or held up to enable welcome to enter the field? No, um, I, I don't have that sense. I would have thought it would have been disgraceful behaviour on behalf of those who had the policy, if policy existed, to say we must slow anything down so some British company can, can get a contract. I mean, that would be totally wrong. And that wasn't really in the way in which people thought in those days. Um, I, I, I don't believe that that, was, that, that, that that was likely. And I would certainly have been against it, and if asked, and if there was a submission, I would have said that I was against that on those grounds. Um, and then... Um a, a, a further document from August 1985, which is DHSC 01017054. Um, this is a minute from, I think it's Dr. Oa to Dr. Sibelis, 23rd of August 1985. We go to the top of the page. We can see it says CMO met PSH, so that's Sir Donald in the meeting with you, on the 22nd of August. One of the matters discussed was the need to have developed in time for a public announcement to be associated with the introduction of blood testing in the blood transfusion service on the 14th of October. A clear policy for the use of the alternative facilities. So this is the issue, law pattern, about alternative testing sites, about there being facilities for people to go along and be tested rather than turn up at transfusion session, donor sessions to be tested. Um, um, uh, and then I, I don't think I need to read over the next couple of paragraphs, but if we can go down to um, the penultimate paragraph, thank you. My own view for what it is worth is that we ought to play this carefully. We do not know what the likely demand will be nor do we know what proportion of people presenting for testing will be positive. Um, and then it goes on to say those that do, particularly if they've been encouraged to do so, might quite rightly expect facilities to be available to give them advice. Uh, there'll be no other help that can be offered to them as individuals. And um, perhaps we should wait and see what the initial response is like and how the facilities that are in existence cope with the <coughs> load. Um, do you... Um, uh, again, either recall or have any sense from the documents that you've read for the purposes of, of, of producing your statement of, of the role that 
played in the decision-making process about this question of, or this fear that people would turn up at donor centres just to get tested and find out if they were HTLB3 positive. Do you recall that featuring significantly in the decision-making process? It was certainly always being raised, that you know, the, the fourth negative, fourth positive, people being put off, people coming to get a test because they wanted a, to, to know whether they were positive or not. That, that, that was whizzing around in people's minds all the time. I, I, I suspect that I was asked to have this meeting later on in August because of the meetings I held in, in the United States at the very tail end of July. And to a certain extent, it was following on the, uh, the lessons learned and the report back from uh, Jane McKessick, my private secretary, and doubtless coming in a, another direction from um, our post, our foreign office post in, in, in Washington, who would also would have reported back uh, through their attaches as to, as, as to what was said. And I, we were looking very hard, I think, at the United States and their experience because they were f a bit further down the tragic and sad track of the development of AIDS than, than we were at the time, and there were obviously lessons to be learned. Um, I, I, and perhaps just picking up that point about your trip to the United States on this particular issue, DHSC 0002327 underscore 035. Um, so this is um, headed AIDS report of discussions in USA 29 to 31st of July, uh, and it, then it refers to PSHs, so that's your visit to New York um, and Washington. Um, I just want to go over to the bottom of the second page. Um, we can see under the heading screening, at the bottom of that page, there have not been problems with mm. massive demand for screening tests at USA blood donor centres. In anticipation that there might have been such a demand, the federal government has provided funding for the setting up of alternative site testing facilities. However, these have not been widely used since the homosexual community has adopted the attitude that as about 60 to 70 percent of the number have probably been infected uh, they might as well behave as if they are. Yeah. There's nothing which can be done if they prove to be antibody positive and no certainty that they will become ill so that they see the test as having no purpose from their point of view. I think that was a picture I picked up when on the New York um, leg of the trip I went to the gay men's crisis center uh, and was informed that people were saying, well, it's what's going to happen to me, so... I'm just going to carry on. And that this was something which was very, very, very important in trying to get the health education prevented, preventative message across uh, back in the United Kingdom, that we didn't have that, that unfortunate view, that it simply wasn't worth getting tested. Um, and then just to complete the, the documentary picture and the chronology in relation to the introduction of um, HIV screening, if we look at PRSE... 0002603. We can see the announcement that was made by you on the 23rd of August 1985, um, setting the date for the introduction of the screening test. John Patton today announced that, the route, that routine screening of all blood donations for antibodies to the AIDS virus should be introduced by mid October uh, uh, and then. Um, reference is made to the, uh, the arrangements that were in place and then if we pick it up in the fourth paragraph you say um, it's important that we reduce the risk of AIDS being spread through blood transfusions and blood products this risk is already extremely small but screening all blood donations will reduce it still further um, yeah that phrase the risk is already extremely small is obviously something to reflect on Look, looking back now at that overall picture from June of 1984, I think it was, when um, there was that minute about making this a top priority, doing it as soon as possible, through to the introduction of the tests in October 1985, and having regard to all the material that, that you've looked at for the purposes of your statement, obviously we've only looked at some of it in the course of the afternoon, 
do you think there was a sufficiently strong line taken, a, a sufficient sense of this being top priority? I think it was a leading priority. Um, I believe that in that period, which standing by itself, that might seem a long time, but during that time, government was pretty active under the leadership of um, the CMO in, in the whole testing regime and making sure it was safe and was going to deliver a results which were as accurate as could be for the, for the user community and those who, uh, and those who were infected. So I, I think this was time taken to try to get it right rather than delay. Do you think it could have been done more quickly? I don't know. I simply don't know. If I did, I assure you, I would tell you. Um, so I know the time. Um, I've probably got about 15, 20 minutes more questions for Lord Patton myself. And, um, well, so let, let, me, let me ask uh, Lord Patton what he would like to do. Um, Lord Patton. Uh, the, the choice is this. Um, council can go on, rather than us have a break here and now, for, she estimates, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, take the outside of that. I'm so minutes. sorry. I'm having hearing problems. Ah, sorry. It's not, I'm sure it's not you. It's probably me, but I don't know whether it can be turned up. Well, let me, let me take it more slowly. Can you hear that? Yes, I can. Yeah. Uh, you have a choice. Council says that she has about 15 to 20 more minutes questions of her own uh, for you. Uh, assume 20 minutes. Then there will be uh, a, a break. Um, and then uh, during that break, those who are core participants can ask their council to put questions to, uh, uh, to you through council to the inquiry. So there would, that would be 20 minutes more questions break of a, I don't know how long, half an hour probably, and then a final session. The alternative is a break now, 15 to 20 minutes of questions, a further break, and then the questions from core participants. Well, I think it's probably maybe for the convenience of, of your inquiry, Sir Brian, if we crack on now. Very well. Call, but say but you're, you're, you're happy with that for your, yourself, because mm -hmm. I'm conscious that you've sat there answering questions for a long time. No, I don't, I don't mind that at all. I, I just think it makes absolute logic for, for Council to continue to, to, to question me now we're, we're making progress. That's what we'll do. But a break after that would be agreeable. Well, we, we'll certainly have one. Um, Lord Patton, um, a, a couple of further documents from the from the tail end of your time in the department, if I may. DHSC 0002275 underscore 083. Um, this is a minute of the 21st of August 1985 addressed to your private office, um, and it says AIDS action PSH, so that's you, requested a summary of action taken and details of areas where action is under consideration. Please see note attached. And then if we go over the page, we have um, a, a list of, of actions taken. The first is advice to health professionals. Yep. And there's a whole list there of uh, different respects in which uh, advice has been given to health professionals. Presumably, this is all referring to advice that's either from the department or from the CMO or from one of the public bodies such as CDSC or one of the expert advisory groups. Is that, is that, is that right? You're, you're, you're nodding. That's a yes, I yes. think. Just for the, for the transcript. Um, so that would suggest that there's, again, there's no, there's no reason why the department couldn't issue advice for the benefit of health protections on issues relating to AIDS or risks from blood products and blood if it wished to. Correct. Um, and then if we go to the next page, 
we have the heading information to at-risk groups and public um, and there are five items there identified health education council leaflet all so that presumably means that's for the benefit of the public as a whole and that would be the reference to the health education council that we leaflet that we we discussed earlier lord Patton. would that be right May you repeat that, please? Yes, of course. So the reference to the Health Education Council leaflet all is probably a reference to um, that Health Education Council publication that was discussed earlier, yeah. um, which was going to try and um, educate people about the dangers of certain forms of sexual activity. Yes, and I think sometimes set in the context of other health education, possibly wrongly, in it to sort of soften the impact, but the Health Education Council came up with its, with its own ideas. Uh, and then the, the fourth item here is the National Blood Transfusion Leaflet to blood donors. Sorry, it's still the top of the page, please, Lawrence. So the, the, four, the fourth item under paragraph three is the, is the blood donor leaflet, which I've already asked you about. Below that is a reference to Terence Higgins Trust leaflets, presumably aimed predominantly at the gay community. Um, but it's the two items that are said to be for the benefit of haemophiliacs I wanted to ask you about. So you're told there that there's been a Haemophilia Society leaflet and Haemophilia Centre Director's book um, uh, for the benefit of haemophiliacs. It, it, it would seem from that that in terms of the provision of information to haemophiliacs and at-risk groups, the department hadn't produced anything itself. All it can identify here is material produced by others. Yes, um, I don't remember ever having seen either of the, well, either the society leaflet or, or the director's book. And if anyone would have seen it, it would have been um, Simon Glen Arthur. Uh, that's my view. But I don't know whether submissions were being compiled at the time and whether at a later date uh, there was any leaflet coming out from the department. I have no idea whether that happened, as I, I left the department at the end of, um, at the end of August. Um, and then um, that really leads to the, the, the last contemporaneous document from your time in office I wanted to ask you about, DHSC 0000496. Um, this is a minute from oh, yes. uh, or a note from Baroness Trumpington, dated the 28th of August 1985, directed to you. She says, I find a number of recent meetings have taken place on this subject to which I've not been invited. I'm concerned that officials have not borne in mind my responsibility for our interest in this subject. I'm aware, of course, of the important discussions you had during your recent visit to the United States and that you'll naturally wish to be significantly involved in taking these matters forward. Nevertheless, you will be aware of my concern over this matter, and then there's a reference of, to a minute she sent to Kenneth Clark, and I'm anxious that officials should be in no doubt that as the minister with particular responsibility, I wish to be kept closely informed at all stages. <coughs> I'm copying this minute to the CMO so he can ensure I'm appropriately consulted. I hope you will agree that this is the right action. Um, did, did you understand that as a polite way of saying to you to stop being so involved in matters relating to AIDS and blood? I don't think it was, it was that. It was a very um, uh, sh uh, slight slap on the wrist um, from um, her ladyship. Uh, she was well aware, I think, but she'd only been in the department a, a few weeks. Um, she was uh, well aware that I had been sent at the request of the Secretary of State and other people to go to the to go to the United States specifically to look at not blood um, policy issues, but specifically to look at how better health education and either scaring or nudging people who were at risk uh, could, be, could be carried out. And the, there was a clear overlap in what I'd been asked to do. And I wouldn't have gone to the United States on my own bat to do this stuff. I was, uh, I was asked so to do it. Um, after, after consideration. And I think something um, must have gone wrong uh, in the sending of uh, for information um, memorandum to her 
that she should have had, and that, that, that was wrong. And uh, maybe I should have ensured that when I looked at the copy list that, you know, this hasn't, um, hasn't gone to her. Uh, we can take that down, thank you, Lawrence. Um, we parted very good friends. Um, I d just now have a, 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 a few further, um, some specific, some more general questions, L L Lord Patton. The, the first is this. Do, do you ha have any sense of whether um, a, a, the agenda of privatisation, topical during the 1980s, and um, um, whether that played any role in relating to decisions regarding either self-sufficiency or the importation of factor concentrates from commercial companies? None whatsoever. Um, I was at a later stage um, involved in privatization in another department where I was a Minister of State uh, in, in the front line. But I, I cannot remember privatization as being an issue at any time in the Department of Health bit of the old DHSS. Um, next, can I ask you to look at JEVA 0000121. Um, this is an extract from a, a newspaper cutting from 25th of April 1984. It's The Guardian. Um, typhoid warning. Holidaymakers planning to visit the Mediterranean should arrange typhoid vaccinations now, the junior health minister, Mr John Patton, said yesterday. Nearly 200 people caught typhoid abroad last year, 51 of them in the Mediterranean area, he said. No one died, but protection was necessary, and the vaccination should be given six to eight weeks before the holiday. Malaria was also on the increase, Mr. Patton warned. People visiting parts of Africa, et cetera, et cetera, should consult their doctors about taking a course of anti-malarial tablets before, during, and after the trip. Um, would, would you agree that that is an example of you as a minister um, ah. actually becoming involved in the direct provision of public health information uh, for the benefit of, of the wider public? Yes, on the face of it, it can be nothing else, logically. And, and do you um, have any more general recollection of the, um, the frequency with which ministers might make such pronouncements? No, I mean, I can't remember being involved in um, matters concerning the avoidance of, of typhoid. It must have been an issue, and I presume advice came up, and they looked for someone to... Um, to top and tail a press release with. But I mean, I don't believe that there was anything other than a straight <coughs> public information issue being raised here. And, and neither was I making any judgment on the science of the typhoid vaccinations and substituting my own judgment for medical experts. Uh, if we can look next to a completely different doc document, JEVA 0000122. And if we go to what should be the second page, I think. Or is this the cabinet stuff? Yes. So this is um, um, a cabinet meeting from the 25th of June 1992. And obviously you were in attendance at this nothing to do with the Department of Health, but in your capacity as Secretary of State for Education. Um, if we go to page, I think it's page six, Lawrence, probably. Yes, bottom of the page. There's a discussion there about, um, uh, introduced by the Secretary of State for Health about extensive publicity about a man infected with HIV as a result of treatment for haemophilia and who it was claimed had infected a number of, other, a number of women, um, said the case served to illustrate the gravity of threat to the public health from HIV, and so on, and then there's a further discussion about it. Um, I'm not asking you about that specific case, um, Lord Patton. I, this is Virginia Bottomley, I this presume. Would be Virginia, yes, I think it must have been Virginia Bottomley at that point in time. Um, the question is a wider one, and this document is really a trigger for that. Um, to what extent do you recall issues about infected blood or the um, 
the plight of, of haemophiliacs and others infected with HIV uh, coming before the Cabinet. I cannot remember any such occasion. And do you have any more general sense of what the, the criteria were that might determine whether something came up in a Cabinet meeting or not? Each week in preparation for Cabinet, the Cabinet Secretariat would sweep around and say, is there anything that needs to be uh, raised at Cabinet? Very often rejecting large amounts of it because it was uh, special pleading or seen as special pleading by Secretary of State to, to get this or that issue or this or that funding. So it was quite um, tight uh, control of what was put up because the person who was really deciding the agenda and it's the case today, is the, is, is, is the Prime Minister of the day. Um, but if uh, there was a particular issue that a Secretary of State wished to raise and it was of pressing interest, then one could make a case to the Cabinet Secretary, uh, in those days Sir Robin Butler, um, that this really shouldn't, should be on the agenda. Or if you want to swing the bat, uh, and right at the end, bring it in without uh, actually having forewarned anyone. But that was quite often a dangerous thing to do. So one didn't do it because people weren't briefed. We can take that down. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, during your time at the Department of Health, 1983 to 1985, did you, um, do you have any sense of, of the role of the Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher, in any decision-making regarding the spread of AIDS or, or, or risk reduction measures or, or, or public information campaigns? None whatsoever. I cannot recall a, a, a discussion um, with her, and I wouldn't have raised it, or we did from time to time talk, without having briefed her thoroughly beforehand, because she was extremely busy. Um, would, would any such discussions be more likely then to have taken place at Secretary of State level rather yeah, than from yeah, a junior minister? Absolutely. If, if they took... Um, I'm sure that Norman Fowler will have had that sort of discussion with her, whether at Cabinet or in the margins, but I can't remember from the record. Um, then um, a, a further press release on a slightly different topic, um, but, but, but one was ha which has a... A, 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 a relevance which I hope will become apparent. MACK 0002646-041. Now, this was a May 1985 press release. Yeah, I remember that. Launching an initiative on international co collaboration to prevent drug misuse. Um, w was that or, or the the health consequences of drug misuse, was that something which fell within your portfolio of responsibilities? Is that something which...? Fell within your portfolio of responsibilities. So... Uh, yes. Oh, you mean generally? Yes, as yeah. in blood yeah, and blood yes. products. Uh, health education welfare. certainly did. Uh, and that's why I was involved, for example, in the joint, and I always felt rather effective, uh, working party between David Mellor in the Home Office and myself, uh, long similar lines here about the dangers of drug abuse. And it was a bit of rather effective cross-departmental working, which didn't always happen well, but it certainly worked that time around. Um, w would you have, um, uh, do you think, understood at the, at the time you were at the Department of Health um, that there may, was a high incidence of, of drug use in prisons or, or a high number of prisoners who had some history of drug drug misuse? In that particular period, I, I don't remember, but when fast forwarding my third ministerial job as a, a long-standing Minister of State in the Home Office, I certainly understood it very well, and it was a matter of very, very great and grave concern. But I, I can't remember it being raised when I was in the Department of Health. Did, do you have any knowledge of whether blood was still being collected from prisoners in 1983-84? In No. I knew, I believe at the time, that it was still being collected on a fee-paying basis in the United States from people in universities, including uh, East Coast universities, which seemed to me to be extraordinary. But they were selling their blood in that kind of way, and that was always a matter of great concern. And it was lamentable that it was happening. But I have no uh, evidence 
about the UK. If it were the case that blood were being taken from prisoners still in 1983, 1984 in, in the UK, and I stress if, um, is that something that you think ministers should have been made aware of, at least when AIDS came on the, the horizon? If it was happening, for sure. But I would have thought that's the kind of thing that I would have reacted to because of my cross-departmental responsibilities with Manor in the, in the Home Office about trying to stop injections and blood and all the rest of it happening. Um, but I have no memory. Fine. And we can take that down. Um, the, the last, um, well, last couple of questions, again, they're, they're fairly general questions, Lord Patton. Um, we, we've looked at a, a range of submissions um, submissions to ministers which uh, will draw perhaps on the expert views of those within the department, uh, may draw upon advice that's been provided by expert committees and, 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 and working parties. Um, whether at the, your time at the Department of Health or, or in any other department, Home Office, Education, elsewhere, what, what scope was there for hearing for ministers to hear from those who might be most affected by policies. So the views of pupils and parents, for example, at the Department of Education, or the views of patients at the well, Department of There were lots of, of opportunities for that. Um, in, in, then in relation to the Department of Health, do you recall the extent to which or how attempts were made, if at all, to, to try and capture the, the, the views or experiences of patients? I mean, there were opportunities. I can certainly remember um, AIDS-infected sufferers coming to meetings in the DHSS. I'm sure they must be minuted somewhere that are, that in someone's diary. It must still be there that that happened, because they came into my office and we sat down and had a cup of tea and talked, and I tried to understand, or to understand better, what was, what, what was going on. I cannot remember anyone from the Infiliac community coming to a meeting at the, at the DHS. As I, I wish in retrospect now that there, that had happened. I was certainly more alert to the general use of, of um, drugs by drug misusers. Um, and, and then final question for now, um, Lord Patton. Um, whether in relation to discussions about um, the blood donor leaflet or discussions about the health education council leaflet or, or, or any of the other matters we've been, we've been looking at. Do you recall the, whether there was, within the department or within ministerial colleagues, uh, any sense of squeamishness or reticence about having to discuss uh, issues relating to sexual activity or, or, or any other? Oh, for sure. Some people thought it was all a bit indelicate and it didn't really happen and it shouldn't happen. <laughs> that, that didn't include me. Uh, I was felt it was very important for us to put out, put out messages. But ministers were very wary, some ministers, of, of giving any advice in this area because they, 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 they didn't want to um, be parodied in the press for saying Minister X gives advice to use protection during sex. I mean, you could imagine what, well, I can imagine what the son or someone would have done with that uh, in a... In a an unnecessary and cruel way, which wouldn't have helped the general cause, which was to try to get people to take this seriously. Um, so I think trespassed a little beyond 20 minutes, but... The, the, no, carry the, on. I'm... No, no, the, 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 those are the key questions I'm proposing to ask. There are a handful of matters core participants have already raised that I will want to come back to, but what I would suggest we do now is, is take one single break now. I can field any, any questions, and, and then we can come back for a final session. How long do you think you might need as a break? Um, certainly half an hour, sir. Well, let, let's, uh, let's say this then. Um, no later, sorry, no earlier than ten past four, we, we will be back. It might be a wee bit later, but no earlier than ten well, past I'm four. I'm at your disposal. If it needs to be a little bit later, I'm, I'm very happy to. Well, it, we, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let you know that there is going to be a wee bit delayed. Um, but it depends how many questions come, come to Council. <laughs>